The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I'm coming to you from the Broken Skull Ranch way out here in South Texas. As I record this, it's January 2nd, 2017. Here we go, kicking off a whole nother year podcast and family-friendly show today. It's winding down time here at the Broken Skull Ranch out here in South Texas, Tilden, Texas, to be specific, and McMullen County. My brother-in-law and his girlfriend just left today. They've been here for about four or five days, so we've been hanging out with them. Ted Fowler, three six ones on the other end of the compound. It's finally got a little bit of peace and quiet up in this damn place, and I'm glad for it. In regards to all the hunting, we have taken all the numbers that we need to take. All of our deer hunting stops as of yesterday. So now it's all about cleaning up, getting all the equipment prepped, serviced, cleaned up, put up, and ready for a little bit of storage time. But first, you know, we still got plenty of work to do. I got to get on my Komodo tractor. I want to mow a couple of senderos, make a couple of passes on some of the fence lines and some of the old trails that got grassed in because we've had too much rain. Well, no, we've had too much rain. We've had a lot of rain, which I'm happy for. All of the tanks out here are chock full of water. Place looks great. There's a couple of hundred ducks living out here. It looks like a wildlife haven. Uh, the deer hunting this year was absolutely phenomenal. Ted Fowler 361 is going to come on here in a little bit. We're going to answer some questions that you guys sent in. A couple of last podcasts I'm going to do with Ted Fowler for uh, quite some time. As uh, I'm about to head out to Los Angeles, he'll be out here for another couple of weeks. We've got some uh, bird hunters coming in here to occupy the place and uh, do a little bit of bird hunting. Uh, me and Ted talked about breaking out the shotguns, but it just turns out as we wrap up these last four days, there's just too much to do out here too many things that i want to get done i'm just uh out of all the things uh anytime i buy a property i'm a little bit ocd on the management aspect of it i want it to look like a park out here in south texas on 2100 acres you're not going to have every single thing mowed up because it's the brush country but i like my roads and my senderos the front here uh the front 10 acres out by my uh lake out there in the front the catfish pond the shark tank I mowed up yesterday. I like all that stuff cut down, so I'll finish doing that. Got the hydraulic f- system fixed on the Komodo tractor. That thing is back in action, and the John Deere's running good. We started the project. You might have saw on my Twitter account, Steve Austin BSR, and on my uh, Instagram account, Steve Austin BSR. Uh, my nephew and I, Neil Wigan, were cutting down a corral over there. And we just finished that project the other day with my brother-in-law, Mitch, pulling those uh, posts out of the ground with the forks and the front end loader on my Komodo tractor, filled in all the holes, cut that down. It was like that corral was never there. So now it doesn't look like an eyesore. Put that over in my yard. I kind of call that my, my, my pile where I keep my pipe and all that stuff. Got that project accomplished. Right now, I'm sitting here in the kitchen. I'm waiting for Shannon Tracy from UVC Power Sports in Alvin, Texas. She's coming out, and she's bringing Buck the Mule. Y'all been seeing the Buck the Mule on Broken Skull Challenge. You people over in England who get the show now, over in the U.K., Ireland, Scotland, all those places, you see that mule? I named that mule Buck a couple of years ago. It's a 2015 Kawasaki Mule Pro FXT, and... I shipped that thing to Shannon Tracy and the gang over at UVC Power Sports in Alvin, Texas, and we made a transformation in this thing, and she's on her way right now. Y'all remember the road trip that I made over there to see uh, Buck in his initial stages when he was a green mule, and I talked with Shannon there in the dealership at UV Country, talked about what we were going to do to it, and we threw all the bells and whistles on this thing, and it's still going to be a workhorse, but uh, I changed a few things that we talked about in the uh, it, we changed a few things that we talked about there in Alvin, Texas. And, man, I'm sitting there looking at the rendering of this thing right now. It's got new decals on it. It's got Buck right there on the front left fender and on the front right fender. On the back of the tailgate, it says Broken Skull Ranch 4x4. Mule holsters say BSR on them. I got some faux crocodile seats that are contoured. These things are really badass. They're really tough. 
I went with a 24 inch light bar in the front and the back and you got to have lights out here in South Texas or wherever you're at just because in the darkness you need light and on the back bumper new bumper that they just came out with has uh, backup lights in it you flip a switch it shoots out a, a beam of light so you can see where you're going it's great for turning around stuff like that uh, on the sides of the doors it's got barbed wire on the black uh, gray silver barbed wire it's just a badass machine we put the 28 inch black water tires on it she got some new wheels for me and I went ahead and went with the sound bar and the subwoofer underneath the front seat. It's Bluetooth uh, compatible, so I'll just get my iPhone, plug in on my George Strait, Keith Whitley, all that stuff that I listen to and jam while I'm out there in the pasture. I've also got the heater installed in this one. And also got a windshield put on this one because I'm planning on taking this one up to Nevada a little bit this year to get some ride time up there. And it gets real cold up there, so this thing is going to be rigged up a little bit differently than we than we had originally planned. And uh, you can see pictures of the build. I'll start posting them on my Twitter account, Steve Austin BSR. But I started a new Twitter account just for Buck the Mule. And if you want to follow me, on well if you want to follow buck on his twitter account his twitter handle is at my mule buck at my mule buck and that way you know i love uh posting pictures of instagram on the things that i like to do but i want to cloud it with too many things so my mule buck will be dedicated to my adventures driving this thing around and the places that i'm gonna get to take it uh also got a winch on the front end replacement of this thing and uh, the windshield is going to be removable so I can put my canopy rack in there because I love the storage that that thing offers. But anyway, so I'm just sitting here uh, in my kitchen table waiting for Shannon to get here. She's going to bring Buck the Mule out here. We'll film that. I'm sure you can see that on her website, UEC Power Sports. And she's also going to pick up my other two mules and take them back down there and service them. Uh, my 2015 uh, Pro XT and my Pro FX. And we've got about 90 hours on both of those machines. They'll get their 50-hour service. Uh, we rode the hell out of them last deer season and this season. And I'll get one more ox rack put on my ranch edition, and I'll leave that other rack on that green FX. Those things have been uh, really, really handy out here. So I'll go ahead and rig that one up to keep hunting out of it. So... Man, it's just tying up all the loose ends out here. It's been an absolute blast. I don't know what the hell is going on in the world right now. I rarely watch TV. Uh, we tried to watch UFC 207 the other day. The cable company, whatever, screwed up our order because it came on so late. I was just going to watch it the next day so I could see the Ronda Rousey, Amanda Nunez fight. And for some reason, it didn't record, and it was a real pain in the neck. They had sent the pay-per-view to our California house, and my wife got on with them. And after about an hour and a half, two hours of going back and forth, got them to refund our money, I got a chance to watch the Rousey Nunez fight on YouTube. Obviously, it was very grainy. I tell you what, that Amanda Nunez is a bad stick of wood, and we'll have to see what Ronda Rousey decides to do with her future from here on out. Uh, will she start a family? Will she go into acting now? She has a great uh, bunch of endorsement gigs, and she's really kicked ass at. But it was a really one-sided fight. Didn't get a chance to see the rest of the card. I heard the rest of the card was pretty damn good. When I get back to Los Angeles in about a week, I'll check out the card. And uh, I'll end up buying it again or see if I can find it on somewhere where I ain't got to pay for it or know all the results. But I want to see. I know uh, there was a hell of a fight between two guys. I can't even remember the name right now. It's been so long. My wife, Kristen, is in here. She's about to start all her cleanup duties. Uh, by the time we tie this thing up, the place is spotless. Take everything down to the junkyard. Like I said, all the equipment's been serviced. You know, a little bit more mowing to do. Kristen, I know you're ready to get back to Zoom, but that's one of the questions out here on my Q&A. I just wanted to include that uh, with you here because I know you're not going to be on the Q&A talking with me and Ted. The question was, what do you do all day out here? <laughs> And I'm thinking, man, uh, you would think being out here in the middle of nowhere, that's an easy thing to, uh, to answer. She doesn't do nothing, just hangs around the house all day. She works her ass off. This house, for some reason, just collects – I mean, it's a great house. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a real pain in the neck keeping this thing clean. So she's cleaning the house all the time. 
you got a vacuum every other day because of our three, uh, our two Labrador retrievers, Hershey and Mula. Plus, uh, Ted's dogs come over and drop hair and tear everything up. There are stickers between cleaning uh, and she's cooking and hunting and cleaning. And we've had visitors here. My dad and his buddy just left. There is a million things to do. I haven't touched a weight, really, in about a month. And I'm looking forward to getting back to L.A. to ease back into that. She'll finally get back to her Zumba class. But uh, she reads a little bit when she gets a chance to. I don't have her microphone plugged in. But it, it is nothing but absolute work. And and my wife doesn't get up in the morning to get on the early morning hunts. She always goes on the evening hunts. So she'll sit in a deer stand, film deer, you know, tell us, you know, what where's, you know, tell us what kind of deer she's seeing. We'll get a scouting report to get a different set of eyes out there to see what else needs to be taken. Again, like I told you last night, Creston, when I uh, took those last two things that were done on our hunting, uh, we're through. We're absolutely through. There's going to be some bird hunters come out here and uh, get some bird hunting in while we're gone. Teddy will stay out here and guide them. Or hell, my brother's going to come out here with a bunch of his friends for the next few weeks. So uh, the place will still be up and running, but we will be back in L.A. Are you looking forward to get back to L.A.? Now, here's the thing. We had to rent a house because our renovations are taking a little bit longer than we thought they would. And that being said, let me plug in your microphone real quick. I know you're looking forward to getting back to L.A. We're going to leave out of here on uh, about five or six days, and I'm going to have some Bloody Mary mix made. And so that's that's kind of our tradition, one of our yeah. rituals. We always like to have our Bloody Marys on the airplane. Correct. But only one or two because you got to drive on the back yeah. end. So yeah, we got a Range Rover waiting at the uh, FBO for us. Going to fly private. Hershey and Mula got plenty of room. I'm bringing back a big 105-quart uh, Yeti cooler full of deer meat. Shannon Tracy is bringing me one of those Yeti coolers. Uh, looking forward to seeing how that thing works and how yeah. much deer meat we can get in there because we've got a ton. But I know you're looking forward to getting back to L.A., but we got to move a bunch of stuff into our <laughs> rent house so we can get situated because our house is absolutely, totally demoed. Completely. So, yeah, we have to get our at least our mattress out of the garage and, you know, somehow we can walk it down the street, I suppose. <laughs> well, I got those... Um, I got those uh, rollers. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, my dollies. I got those flat dollies. So we'll get that thing over there. The neighbors then, are going to really wonder what's going on when we've oh, got man, a mattress going down the sidewalk. <laughs> but we, we, you've got the uh, box spring coming, or the, what do you call it, bed I frame? I bought one of those bed frames just, just to put Just a cheapy bed, bed yeah. frame so we can put on a mattress. And Because our other bed was so tore up, we were yeah. using, on my left-hand corner, we had books stuffed <laughs> underneath one of the legs. <laughs> the damn thing broke years ago. Well, years ago, you put a dolly under there to hold it up. Well, <laughs> that dolly would still be there if you hadn't made me change it but anyway i had a jerry rig with a bunch of books and then when a guy came in he goes you know i can fix that i'm like no man we're done with that bed just t- just take it put it in the trash bin with all the other stuff it's taken out and get rid of it i'll get a brand new bed yes we will but it'll look it'll be, it'll be interesting to get back into the house when we do it's going to take a couple of more months of Doing all the demo and the rebuilding of everything, my, I'll have a dedicated podcast area because yes. we got rid of that couch. Yeah. So that's going to be good. And when to put the front doors in, it'll be like a, a nice living indoor outdoor space. I just can't believe how long it takes to do all this. Uh, man, I'm I thinking a what? couple of weeks, and then he yeah. says it's going to be a couple of months. I thought, oh my goodness, it really caught me by surprise. But at least we found a house to yeah. to, uh, to stay in, and it's not too far away. And I know you're just looking forward to getting back to LA. Well, yeah, and just for the fact that the grocery store is like. A half a mile from our house. A half a mile versus <laughs> 55 miles. Yeah. That's a big-ass difference. Yeah. And it's just those little things, man. When you come out here, and like, like I was just saying, Chris and Elvin, I don't, in the world, I don't know what's going on because... We don't even know what day it is. We, yeah. I just know that I got to turn the podcast in. <laughs> but it's it's like, you just wake up, and, and every morning is, just, is the same. I wake up at 520. I drink two, uh, two cups of coffee. I go sit in a deer stand. Whatever happens, happens. Then I get back to work. My tractor was down. It was fixed, so now I'm cutting things again. But it's just nothing but Well, then you removed that fence over there yesterday. Yeah, we got the corral down. Yeah. That looks phenomenal. you got to drive over and look at it. Yeah, I will. It was just kind of an eye source where that double wide used to be, and we moved it over here, so we tore that down. But we got a lot of good stuff done over here. Yeah, we did. But now it's time to pack it up. And here's the thing. I love it out here. And one of the things I love about it the, about the most is just how peaceful it is. It's it so is peaceful. friggin' quiet. Yeah. And you know when we get back to Los Angeles, all the sirens, the ambulances, the honking of the horns, just the, the traffic, gardeners. the, the <laughs> loud-ass blowers of the mowers, the damn loud-ass Harley-Davidson's going everywhere. <laughs> 
It's going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to have PTSD. <laughs> And I'm going to come back out here. Well, I'm just going to I'm going to do like a three week turnaround because I'm going to get settled in L.A., do some podcasts with some guests, get some uh, really good interviews, and then I'm going to come back down in here and do some more mowing. Yeah, and uh, did you think uh, Cold Steel for the nine pounds of seized candy that we? <laughs> God dang man, Cold Steel sent those honey baked hams, and the, man, there was we, two of them. We yeah. were eating on those. We just finished uh, another one the other day, and then they sent us three pounds of seized candy. No, no, nine pounds. Nine pounds. Well, three boxes of three, three boxes. And you said, oh, we'll just uh, we won't be we won't eat those. You've already gotten into three boxes of it. <laughs> I weigh about two ninety. <laughs> and the thing about it is, it looks like I've been in a fight with that Edward Scissorhands. My arms and my legs are scratched beyond recognition, because every year it's just going in after those deer in that brush country, and I didn't have my car hard on the other day. Well, that I got was all ripped up when you were cutting the firewood. What? That's when you got all those scratches on you when you're cutting. Well, yeah. When I, well, I was trimming the trees, and then after you get all the junk limbs off, that's when you start making your firewood off those big limbs. And, and then, when do we ever use firewood? We got about <laughs> a nine-day window <laughs> when you can make fires out here in Broken Skull Ranch. But I got a couple cords stacked against the other barn over there, so by the time we come back next year, it'll be seasoned and ready to go. Yeah, and that firewood will probably last us five years. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, that's enough of all that stuff. Let's get ready to get into the body of the podcast, and we're going to get into the rest of the show here in a minute. But first, everyone on this great green earth is a unique individual. You don't walk like anyone else, or talk like anyone else, or even sleep like anyone else. So, why is your mattress one size fits all? It doesn't have to be anymore, thanks to Helix. Go to helixsleep.com, answer a few questions, and they'll use their proprietary algorithm to run a 3D biomechanical model of your body to create the most comfortable mattress you've ever slept on. Helix worked with the world's leading sleep scientists to develop this formula so that everyone can get an affordable, customized mattress and enjoy the best sleep of their lives. Helix even customizes each side of the mattress for all you couples out there, and here's the best part. You have 100 nights to try it out and if you don't love your custom mattress helix will pick it up for free and give you a full refund no questions asked so go to helixsleep.com slash podcast to get fifty dollars off your order that's helixsleep.com slash podcast helixsleep.com slash podcast okay it's a brand new year and podcast one's got a whole bunch of brand new coming your way we're talking about new shows from Layla ali the forbes network nascar's larry McReynolds, real housewife kim zolchak amazing scripted series like murder made me famous tori spelling and dean mcdermott richard marks norman lear and many many more so get on board for 2017 and download the podcast one app now that way you can take us with you all year long <laughs> happy new year from podcast one.com the Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I'm sitting here at my dinner table, just like I was when I did the opening of the show. Ted Fowler, 361, just strolls through the door. Got a bottle of water in his hand. But what he doesn't know, he just found out that he's got a 20-ounce Yeti tumbler with a Broken Skull Ranch margarita inside of it. I've got one over here in my 20-ounce tumbler. All Teddy Fowler's got to do now is make a decision of whether he's going to accept the Broken Skull Ranch margarita or decline it because, Teddy, I ain't going to put no pressure on you. I ain't even made eye contact with him yet. <laughs> you don't have to feel any pressure to drink his drink because if you don't want to drink it, it'll be my second drink and you can keep drinking your water. Now, Ted Fowler, faced with this impending decision looming right now as we start the podcast and get into a few Q&As, what are you going to do? I hate are you going to drink the margarita alone. or are you not going to drink it? <laughs> hate to see you drink alone. No, I'll drink it. Here, cheers. It's been a good year. What's happening? What are you doing over at your compound? Nothing. Sitting on my thumb. 87 degrees out there. God dang it, man. People from UV country, Shannon and Tracy and her husband Scott, just came out here and delivered Buck and Mule. I've been telling you guys about him on the podcast. Me and Ted Fowler rolled down there to Alvin, Texas and checked it out. Uh, talked to Shannon and Tracy, and it came in today. And, man, I'll post some pictures on my Twitter account. They totally blacked it out. We put a different nose clip on there. It changed from green to black. Got lights all over it, Ted. God dang, that's one of the things when we go do our thing at the end of the night where we got to drop some materials off at a certain area. The bad thing is not having any backup lights on those buggies. Yeah. And you get your little headlamp on your flashlight. I take my hat off and shine back there. So, boy, I tell you what, I'm going to light it up tonight. We're done hunting. We're going to bring on the bird hunters. We've got a bunch of bird hunters coming in the next few weeks uh, to come in there and shoot some shots and see what, well, we'll see how that goes. But 
we're done hunting, but I'm going to give it, uh, that mule a ride tonight and just see all that extra lighting and see how it pays off because, man, God dang, when the sun goes down, it's dark and you need some lights. i got a sound system on that thing, and i got a windshield in case it's it gets right. cold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't might have to that off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, man, it's been a good year as we wrap this thing up. Now we've got to go into full work mode. Filling up protein feeders. I got to get on my tractor, cut some more senderos, and uh, patch everything up. There's some holes over here. Those damn woodpeckers put in the uh, side of the house. Need to get you some, put some more T111 panels up there. Uh, what do you think? Anything else we need to do? Just clean up all the equipment, clean out the barn. No, just get ready for summertime. <laughs> Say that in January. As it's 85 degrees right now. Yeah. God dang it. I'm so glad we're done hunting. You know what? It's been a lot of fun. And, you know, when you say that, I'm so glad we're done hunting. Man, it's been intense. you got to understand, this place is 2,000 acres. And it's basically, you know, two guys doing hunting. You know, my brother came down. My dad comes down with a couple of his friends. But, you know, this is a place that actually eight to ten people could hunt on throughout the year. Oh, sure. Sure. And it's just you and I yeah. doing the bulk of taking out the numbers that we need to take out of. So you talk about a very intense period. Every time I come out here, my agents think, oh, man, you know, Steve takes two and a half months out and goes deer hunting. It is deer hunting, but it's work. And from sun up to sundown, we're doing everything in, in the world, doing the podcast two days a week. But, man, there's so much work out here. It just it changes you. Boy, it's like a big weight has been lifted you know what i mean the responsibility of getting our quota done uh you know i had every intention last night of taking out the camera and the big lens and getting some real good pictures of deer this morning and that alarm went off at 5 15 and i was like it i'll just i'll reset it for 5 45 there's no reason to be there that early and it went off again at 5 45 and i said you know what <laughs> i'm not doing it today man i'm tired i'll do it tonight and you know, go at it again. I'd love to hunt, love to be out there, but it's just a grind, you know. Well, I got your text message. I stayed in, I stayed in today. I was like, well, that's a first. Because <laughs> you've only missed, just like me, only one or two hunts yeah. because it was Aaron runnings or something like that where you had to go do stuff or I had to go do stuff. But other than that, I mean, we was up every single morning in the stand every single evening. You're out there cleaning deer and, and doing everything else. So, yeah, man, last night when, you know, finished things up, it's like – as much as we love to hunt, it's not like we're coming out every weekend and hunting for two days at a time. Man, as soon as we roll out here from, well, we, I got out here November 15th, every single day, that's six, eight weeks, whatever it is, almost seven weeks of hunting every single day. And, you know, you can't take something every single day because you don't see something every Correct. single day, but you're out there in the woods trying. So it's it's a very intense process where when mostly your weekend warriors and i'm not saying that as a disparaging comment but a lot of you know weekend people that go hunting yeah, yeah, yeah. their lease hey man they do their normal job and they get to go let their hair down for a day and a half two and a half three days on a long weekend and go on back man we're out it's steady 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 from start to finish and by the time you know the rut hits you know and the drinks are flowing and all that other stuff, and I ain't worked out in I don't know how long. Boy, I'm, I'm running pretty ragged. <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to getting back to L.A. so I can kind of take a break. I've got some meetings and stuff planned when I get back, but, man, I'm just looking forward to, first of all, you know, I, I love hunting. Yeah. But, man, you know, I got my gut full. Man, I looked at myself this this morning in the mirror, and I think this is the longest it's been without a haircut. You know, I felt like Moses, you know, <laughs> minus the beard, of course. You know, but, yeah, I'm, I am I love to hunt. I love being out here. I love doing this, but I'm, I'm ready to go back, you know, and I've still got some more work to do out here yet. Yeah, but here's the thing. We've got plenty of work to do, but Kristen's brother just left. He was here for four days, and, man, yeah, he's a barrel of monkeys. He's got a great... Uh, personality loves to hunt he's extremely knowledgeable he can fix anything but man he rolls in here and you know, he's ready to have a couple of drinks let his hair down he sure. did we had a great time with him but it's like you know my dad comes down it's a great time with him when my nephew neil comes down have a great time with him it's like all right man and they come out fresh you know <laughs> hey man we done been in the trenches man <laughs> it's not like like you know i got five, you know, i got five six seven days left out here but i tell you what it's just working, and you know, we got to tidy everything up. But dude, I'm done. Yeah, I'm tired. 
I'm I'm tired too. I'm tired too. You know, it was nice just kind of kick around there in the barn and start to straighten stuff up and not, you know, not not be sitting there thinking, you know, what we've got four more deer to take. You know, in this age group, we've got you know this many does to take. Got to figure out, you know, who to give them to once we take them, and you know, the processing and fighting with the cooler, which is you know giving me fits right now but we're getting through that yeah it's just nice to be able to relax we shot a couple of nice deer uh in the beginning of the year yourself and myself and then uh my dad took a great uh buck uh mitch my brother-in-law took a great buck we saw some nice deer what were your thoughts on uh, the deer season in its entirety man the deer herd is phenomenal i mean the, the quality of the bucks that i videoed this year and that that everybody videoed um you know, it's just getting better and better and better every year. It's beautiful. But you know what? The thing that surprised me, I thought the rut was going to hit a little bit harder than it did. They were chasing. Uh, you saw probably two or three fights. I didn't see any fights. And I think maybe that's because, you know, we took out a couple of those bully nines, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, early on that came in aggressive. So maybe that's why we didn't see the fights. But, you know, in in years past, you know, sometimes that rut comes on and, boy, everything goes haywire. Now, here's a thing that I did notice this year was you could get a lot closer to a lot of the big deer because they were in such a trance from being in that rut. Yeah. They really let their guard down or their their mind is on something else. It's breeding. And it, it was just amazing to be able to, that, to get that close because they're in a different state of mind. I thought we'd see more fighting. You know what? I, I My opinion on that, I think we're getting – we're getting better at realizing the troublemakers early on, and rather than just talking about it and saying, "Hey, you know what, man? There's a there's a, a bully eight or a bully nine over there, you know that that somebody, you know, needs to take out." You know, we've we've been proactive and and said, "You know what? I, I'm going to shoot that deer because he's going to, you know, break everybody up and and you know take over the breeding." Where before we were a little more passive, trying to let somebody else shoot it, you know, to try to you know spread it out amongst all of the relatives and now it's like and you know what from a deer management perspective that's not the way to do it and i think we're dialed in on that no you ain't kidding i agree with you that that's why we didn't see as many fights and and like when people are saying well what do you mean a bully eight or a bully nine it's just these these bucks in the four and a half five and a half six and a half year range and they come in with this attitude and you know you've got your great you know, ten point bucks, maybe a twelve point buck, and you want those bucks out there breeding. And sometimes right. those are lovers rather than fighters. But those bucks with that attitude will come in there, and it's you know, if if a horn snaps off or something, that that's that's a vanity thing. I just don't, I, I don't want them taking over the breeding rights. And that's what they're fighting for. Correct. So we want to take away those lower numbered point deers, the eights and the nines. From, from the 10s and the 12s, you want those 10s and 12s breeding rather than 8s and 9s, or that you're going to have a bunch of 8s and 9s. So we take those out selectively, and if they've got that attitude, then they've got to go. Yeah, I mean, even though the rut has not started yet, you know, they're, they're definitely pre-rut, those bullies are sending a message to the other, you know, um, more desirable bucks, you know, that if you come in here around the feeder and around the does, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to box with you. You know, so to, and and you're absolutely right. That's not who we want breeding. So they're out. But you know what? Talk about the, how what those those deer coming there. If you've never seen it on, uh, <laughs> man, if you, I don't know if you go on YouTube. I don't have a video of the uh, day for you to watch. But now that I'm thinking about it, because I've already done the close of the show and turned it into Stacy over there in nine hundred two one zero. Man, I don't know if you can get on YouTube and look at uh, bucks fighting or bucks coming in or bucks during the rut. Because man, they come in, they start walking side. I call it the John Wayne walk. And then they'll lay their ears back, yeah. and then they'll bristle their hair up, and and God dang it! And all of a sudden they'll do a dosy do, and they'll kind of almost like two guys in a squared circle, and boom, it's on. Mm-hmm. And it is, and, and they're trying to break each other's neck. They're trying to gore each other. They're trying to stick each other in the shoulder. And it's nasty. But we've we've been able to, you know, like I said, curtail that by yeah. trying to take out those ones that could show that attitude early on. Yeah. But every once in a while, you'll get you'll get you know some upstart that comes walking in there, and they kind of you know, tilt their head to the side and, you know, look out of the corner of their eyes like, you know, anybody want a box? And everybody stands around and goes, nope, you know. <laughs> okay, but you were talking earlier, you said, you know, uh, in the uh, beginning of the rut, and, and the rut has been going on now for, shoot, three weeks. Yeah. Right now, how do you feel? Do you think we're, uh, you think we're uh, post-rut? Do you think we're at the end of the rut? 
I think we're at the end of the rut. I think the Bucks are still moving around a little bit. Um, you know, seeing if there's any open does out there, but I think by and large, uh, you know, most of the hot does have already been bred, and now, you know, it's. I think it's going to be a mad dash by the Bucks to find any open doe. Uh, you probably see a lot more movement in the next couple of days. You know, if you were to drive around, not sitting at a stand, if you were driving around, I think they're chasing through the brush. Um, and I think mid to the end of the week, everything is going to come back to the feeder because it's going to be over. Yeah, uh, but the feeders aren't going to be there. Correct. Because, uh, you know, the, the deer season is over. Protein will. Well, yeah, that that, that uh, it, it'll be interesting because I'm still going to get out a couple of times in the morning and in the evening, mm-hmm. uh, but I got shit. I got a a lot of work to do. We both have a lot of work to do before we uh, – well, you're, you're going to be able to hang out here for a couple of weeks, yeah. and the bird hunter's coming in. We've got a that, – that's going to be interesting arrangements to see how that does. Uh, but I've instructed those guys to take pictures and video any gear mm-hmm. that they see. Mm-hmm. But we we got to get out of here. Okay, let me take a minute here and thank another fine sponsor of the Steve Austin Podcast, Luke Crate. And they're part of the greatest tag team in crate history, the WWE Slam Crate. It's a bi-monthly mystery subscription service for fans of the WWE Universe. And the third crate is ready to order now. This one is all about the road to WrestleMania, and it celebrates the superstars who live, eat, breathe, and sleep this journey. And this crate is loaded with exclusive items featuring The Rock, Seth Rollins, Charlotte, and other WWE superstars. There's also an authentic T-shirt that you can't get anywhere else. So sign up at LukeCrate.com slash Austin by February 15th at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or you'll miss it and regret it. So go to LukeCrate.com slash Austin and use the promo code Austin at checkout to get $3 off your Road to WrestleMania Slam Crate now. That's L-O-O-T Crate.com slash Steve Austin and use the promo code Austin to save $3. But do it now because once that February 15th deadline passes, so does your chance to get this crate. Order now at LukeCrate.com slash Austin. Hey, you know what today's show, Teddy? It is a Q&A, and people send in questions to questions at steveaustinshow.com. So let's answer a few questions. I can sit here and talk about all this BS that's going on out here all day long. Oh, one, one thing I want to get to before we get into the uh, questions. Hey, man, what's the thing about Buck the Mule? Did you get man, to see, I think see it up close? Cool. Yeah, I, I, I was in the barn over there looking at it. Yeah, I, I can't wait for it to be dark and hit all those lights and see what's going on. I mean, I've, you know, we heard the sound bar in the showroom there, which yeah. is very cool. Um Man, it's it's cool, all blacked out like that, and and those seats, those custom seats. Yeah, yeah that that thing's that thing's cool. Man, those contoured seats and that that, that full crocodile kind of grabs you a little bit, but it just gives you you know you get nested in there, mm-hmm. and all that lighting on there, the thirty inch curb bar in the front and back, and got the cube lights in the back that's going to shine the fence line, uh, dude. And I got the dome lights. And the top of the ceiling, mm-hmm. you know, you, you need all that stuff when you when you come out here because dude, dude, dude. <laughs> well, I'm talking to a guy who's afraid of the dark. <laughs> so this light mobile is right up your alley. Yeah, you ain't got to sell me, but I'm, and I'm with you. While we're and I want to give a shout out and a, and a very uh, sincere thank you to Shannon Tracy and Scott from UV Power Sports in Alvin, Texas, because uh, they built Buck the Mule. That's my California mule that you see on Broken Skull Challenge. Uh, and I paid for everything, but they built it. And, and the reason I shipped it down to Alvin, Texas, is because they do badass work. And they took my other two mules, my FX and my FXT. Teddy was running my FX uh, all season long to put some hours on it. And we had about 90 hours each on each unit, about 1,200 and 1,000 miles. So they're going to take them back and service them. Mm-hmm. And they're going to put an ox rack on my ranch edition, just like the FX. Yeah. And then they're going to put a light bar on the front and back of each. So Perfect. we've got the same lighting system, basically, that Perfect. Buck's going to have. Good. 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 And Good. while I'm speaking about Buck, I formed a, I made a Twitter account for Buck. It's my at my mule buck on Twitter if you want to follow along on Buck's Adventures of me, wherever we go, you're going to be able to see it. But I think it's badass. You ready to answer some questions here? Yes, I am. Let's get it. All right. All right. Q&A. Hey, Steve. My name is Nick from Mississippi, and I'm a huge fan of the show. My question is, what is the likelihood of Kurt Angle appearing in a WWE ring this year? God dang. Why I cut and pasted that question, I have no <laughs> idea, Nick. Uh, I know you're from down there in Mississippi. I don't know because... 
I don't know if Kurt Angle and WWE are talking right now. I haven't watched the product in so long. I, well, I haven't watched anything since I've been out here at the ranch because I don't know what in the world is going on. I know Trump won uh, the presidential election. I know that's going to be Alabama and Clemson for the national title. That's going to be a great game. But as far as Kurt Angle appearing in a WWE ring this year, I don't know. Well, I would love to see it. I don't know where Kurt's at. I talked to him a few weeks ago on a podcast before I came down here to South Texas. But I would love to see Kurt uh, competing in the WWE ring. He's one. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer on anybody's list. But will he come back, or will WWE have him back? I have no idea. Here's a question for you, Teddy. All right. And this comes from Dave. He says, thanks for bringing the audio whoop ass twice a week, Steve. I love the shows with Teddy, which make my work day go by faster. Teddy is particular about his foods mixing. Stews are no go, but soups are fair game. With that being the case, where does chili fall on his eating eligibility? Dude, it's like the Frito pie we had the other night with the chili and the chips and the onions and cheese, all of that stuff. Man, I, in my mind, there are groups of food that can commingle. They're supposed to commingle. Like the guy said something about a sandwich. Well, that makes sense. You can't, because of bread and some ham and cheese, mustard mayonnaise, those commingle. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, same I'm, food group. I'm a little quirky, but I'm not going to just eat the bread first and then eat a piece of ham and then yeah. eat a piece of cheese. No, that doesn't work. Um, it's like pasta. It's another food group where everything can co- commingle. Uh, as long as your breadsticks don't get too close to your pasta and get any sauce on them. But chili, I'm good with. That soup that um, had the cauliflower and something else in it. Yeah. There was a little too much action there, so I drained off some of the broth. And just to be a good guest, had had some had some broth, but yeah, no chili. They got to <laughs> compromise your food sensitivities to be a good guest. We've only known each other nine years. You know, I'm not I'm not being a good guest to you. I'm being a good guest to the cook, your wife. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing: the cook has taken herself out of the picture. Yeah. She's been down here cooking and her ass off. And my wife, she loves cooking, but seven weeks worth. When I, when Mitch left, the, I, like I told you, the last five days, she's going to chill yeah. and get her get her groove on and just kind of relax. So Dude, now it's now it's every man for himself. It's two-course meals. <laughs> Dude, if you walk in here, I'll be eating a bologna sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a BYOB. Bring your own bologna, bologna sandwich. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but soup. Hey, man, talk about that Frito pie for a second. Kristen made about three batches of chili this year, knocked it out of the park, throw some Fritos in a bowl, throw some grated cheddar cheese or whatever kind of cheese you like, and then put your chili on top, maybe another extra level of cheese or some onions if you care. Holy smokes, man. I had some leftovers for uh, lunch today. I dig me some Frito pie. I could live on that stuff. It's not the healthiest thing for you. <laughs> Whoever invented the Frito chip, God dang, you're a genius. <laughs> Nutrition wise, you're a complete idiot. But from a taste perspective and a food perspective, and and for, the, 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 Fritos are just good by themselves. Correct. But you throw some cheese and some hot chili on those mugs. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I could kiss that sun gun on the mouth. I'm gonna. I'm next year. I'm gonna have to find a pair of maternity pants that are in camo. <laughs> the way we've been eating. <laughs> I was so happy to find a pair of shorts that that I actually had to wear a belt with to keep them up. <laughs> hey man, Shannon and the gang came came down from UV uh, Power Sports to drop off Buck the Mule, and I said, "Well, I know we'll be filming video." And I wasn't gonna wear shorts because my legs are all scratched up, as are my forearms. From watching, uh, I mean, you know, if you saw me, you'd think that I got in fight with Edward Scissorhands. Yeah. It's walking through this South Texas brush, and I'm so hard-headed, I wear shorts, and I, I just wear these regular dry-fit shirts. But my arms and legs are so scratched up, I had to put on a pair of jeans. My long sleeve shirts fit fine because they're triple X. <laughs> My uh, my thirty eight, thirty fours, or thirty six, thirty fours, whatever they are, man, those they were ringing tight. I was over, you know, how you put those pants on, and you're you're doing the old stretches, you know, squat down, you know, trying to get some slack in them. I was like, oh man, this is gonna look ridiculous. I could barely walk. Just like I had a couple of leg braces on, for because I didn't want to wear shorts in the video. So yeah, man, I tell you what, I, Frito pie, whiskey. 
tequila, oh. uh, fried deer meat. I've been, I've been doing fried tenderloins yeah. for the last few nights. Yeah. Kristen made a hellacious enchilada casserole the other night. I mean, it's been endless. The, the food and the alcohol has been premier, oh. but I'm paying for it. You know, I, had a, I, had a, I loved that meal last night. That enchilada casserole was phenomenal. The fried tenders that we had. Yep. Oh, the, you know, I would have killed to have some of that gravy, but Mitch screwed that up for me. Thank you, Mitch. So here's what happened. <laughs> Kristen always asked me to come over and taste the gravy, the soup, the stew, the whatever, chili. Well, I go in there with a spoon or a wooden spoon, and that's one spoon that's clean, and I take a bite off of it and throw it in the sink and wash it. Mitch goes over there because Kristen says, Mitch, come over and try the uh, gravy and tell me how it is. Swipes his big gigantic index <laughs> finger in there, which we don't know where it's been, whether it's up his ass, you know, scratching his front side or up his nose. Yeah. And so when, when Ted saw that, it's like, <laughs> totally wigged him out that he was not going to be eating the gravy. So, but you really like gravy, right? I do like so gravy. So you weren't yeah. ribbing. You were serious no, about his I would have, and, and the gravy. I would have had the gravy over those tenders had he not stuck his finger in there and swiped through there like a complete barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing was Ted was saying, because Mitch is such a character, it was like Ted said, if I hadn't seen you do it, then I would have eaten the gravy because I hadn't seen you do it. But when I saw you purposely stick your digit in there and stick it in your mouth, <laughs> you've already tainted the entire batch of gravy. That's all it took. That's all it took. Saw it right off. Let's get on to another one. All right, here's, here's a long-winded question. It comes from Chris in Nacogdoches, Texas, down in East Texas. And he says, hey, Steve, you talked on the show before about the game fence that borders the Broken Skull Ranch. The game fence, or high fence as we call it around here in Texas, seemed like a popular trend since the turn of the century in the management of hunting properties. Personally, I live on land that has been in the family for over 130 years. In the past 15 years, over half our ranch has become surrounded by high fence as two neighboring properties became game preserves. One advantage to this is my family got a free fence out of the deal, However, a disadvantage is so much of the land is surrounded by high fence that it has very much hindered my hunting. When I was a kid, white-tailed deer frequently passed through our property and hunting was plentiful. Nowadays, the deer seem to go around my place in order to bypass the neighboring properties because of the high fence. The neighboring properties aren't even a thousand acres combined. When is the use of a high fence too much and should a hunting preserve be over a certain size? Likewise, the neighboring game preserves have exotic deer, so I wondered about the impact on the local ecosystem if those exotics escaped and mingled with the native whitetail population. Plus, one neighbor was buying feral hogs and releasing them on his property. That's the last damn thing we need. There's enough hogs running around here, and we don't need folks bringing them in. The high fence is no match for wild hogs, so they roam over to our place and root up our pasture land. Can you share some advice on what you consider the proper management of hunting preserves in terms of being a good steward of the land? Chris from Nacogdoches, Texas. Chris, thanks for the book. That's the most I've read in 15 years. <laughs> hey, man, I feel you. You know, the fact that you've been on land that's been in a family for over 130 years is awesome. What tradition and history there. Uh, man, the high fence... Here's what happens. People are very particular about deer. And take my property, for instance. My property is 2,100 acres. Two brothers originally owned it. One brother owned 1,500 acres. The other brother owned 500 acres. Instead of building a fence to separate the properties, they put T-post in the ground. So there's no fence. The road that goes between the properties is the road that we named the mason dixon road so one brother was watching a certain deer and the deer would go over to the other brother's side because it's not fenced and the other brother would shoot it or one of his kids would shoot it and it caused a family feud between the mm -hmm. two people that owned the property before i bought it so people are very specific and very they, man, they take deer very personally well, as i do too but man sometimes you get these neighbors because when I was first looking for a place, I was looking for a low-fence place mm -hmm. just because I didn't want a lot of the responsibility that came with a high-fence place. And that's what we got now. I ended up loving it. But 
you know, man, when, when someone, when you when you got a low-fence property, you can only be as good as your neighbors are. Correct, correct. You all got to be on the same page. Hey, man, let four-and-a-half-year-old, five-and-a-half-year-old deer walk, shoot mature bucks, and, you know, or have a point minimum. Well, you can't have a point minimum because some bucks throw uh, a lot of points at a young age. But, man, people get crazy about white-tailed deer. What were you saying, Teddy, about the uh, size of the ranch? Well, and I think any place less than a thousand acres, they shouldn't they shouldn't be able to high fence. Okay, but how are you going to tell that guy that's got nine hundred well, acres you can't high fence? I don't know. You know, I don't know unless the state gets involved. But uh, you know what? Uh, let me recant that last statement. I don't think you can do anything about it. I think people here are going to do what they want to do regardless of any stipulation regulation and if you've got property that's you know kind of getting the short end of the stick because everybody around you is going high fence you know hey dude i don't want to pay you know three dollars for a gallon of gas but when it gets up there that's what you got to do well take this ranch for instance the reason there was a high fence put on two sides of this ranch were the fact that uh, my neighbors to one one side of the property were shooting anything and everything. So they were shooting a lot of the deer that these people valued. So they just fenced those guys out. And so it's, it's control, and it's like those guys don't have any standards. We're going to fence them out. And it's not like they, they necessarily wanted to be fenced in, but they wanted to fence their neighbors out because they didn't have the same standards. So that's the reason a lot of high fences uh, spring up, not because everybody just says, hey, I want a high fence. It's for a reason. I think if your ranch is high fenced, you should have to follow state mandated regulations in you know how you control your deer herd because there's a lot of places that are high fenced, you know, either willingly or unwillingly that don't follow a management program to speak of? Well, we're on a management program to speak of because we're MLD Level 3 here in the state of Texas. It was funny last night. Was last night? We was watching the... Uh, no, it was New Year's Eve night. It was New Year's Eve night. Yeah. We were watching the Clemson and... Uh, who's playing Clemson? Him. Ohio oh, State. No. God dang, I thought Ohio State was going to put up a way better fight than that. God dang, Clemson took it to him. Anyway, Mitch's girlfriend, my brother-in-law, hears someone banging on the door outside. And, she, and all of a sudden, Ted comes up to me because she told Ted, she says, Hey, man, somebody's uh, knocking on the door over there. Ted goes, No, ain't nobody out here. She goes, No, there's somebody out there. <laughs> Ted goes over there, and all of a sudden, he's looking at some young kid about 25 years old. He's yeah. a new game warden. Yeah. And he had come in a mile and a half down my road to get to my ranch. And all of a sudden, Ted comes up to me and says, I'm watching the Ohio State Clemson game. Hey, man, the game board's out here. <laughs> I'm like, on New Year's Eve? Yeah. yeah. We're out here celebrating. I got a crown of water in my hand. I'm just trying to kick back with my brother-in-law and just enjoy this football game. So, anyway, when I, super nice guy. Yeah, he's a real nice kid. Real man, nice I, those guys make the rounds because, man, you know, when he came in, it's a hell of a trek. It's a long trek, yeah. And if I need to show you where he where he was parked yeah. and where he drove in at, because when it was all said and done and, you know, he looked at all of our stuff and we were good to go, uh, I offered to give him a ride back up, you know, to the high fence gate, which I did. And I said, man, where are you parked? And he goes, right there. So I opened the gate, drove through, swung the headlights of the buggy over there on the brush, and I'm like, Dude, what are you on? You know, a bicycle? Where, where's your truck? And he's like, no, it's in the brush over there. You know, so he clicks on, you know, the world's brightest flashlight I've ever seen. I should have, you know, conked him over the head and taken it. <laughs> yeah, but he starts trucking through the brush, you know, to go to his vehicle. And I'm like, man, you are kidding me. You know, the links he went through. Man, but that's what those guys do. But, you yeah. know, like, we the last time we had a game warden out here, I had an idiotic brother-in-law who was out here, and he met him. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a great representation of the ranch. <laughs> He's no longer part of the family. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, you know, Ted told the guy, hey, man, if you want to go look at our uh, logbook, it's out there. Everything's good to go. He goes, no, I already looked at it. Yeah. And we have our logbook in a particular place where you Correct. shouldn't be able to find it. He yeah. goes, well, then this wasn't there, so I figured it would be here. <laughs> that guy had snuck onto the property, CSI, all the deer in our cooler, looked in our logbook, and we played by the book to begin with. So, yeah. Yeah. And I invited him back, and we got his business card, all that bull stuff. 
But, hey, man, we're not trying to do anything illegal out here. We're playing by the rules to try to grow big deer. But the fact that he was able to, and my chair is pointed away from the window. He came in here. He kayfabed us. Oh, yeah. Got into the cooler, got into our log books, saw that we do everything 100% right out here. And we got about nine deer out there, mm-hmm. but they're all tagged. But, dude, he snuck up on us. Well, he, he made mention of the fact he had the night vision goggles, you know, so he comes up, you know, without shining that flashlight. And, hey, we're in here watching the football game. We, nobody ever saw anything. None of the dogs barked. None of the dogs picked up or nothing. You know, so that's, you know, that's good that those guys are out there doing their job. You know, keep everybody oh, yeah, in check. Hey, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, man, I'm all about the game more. Sure, doing sure. Thing, they, they got a great job yeah. to do. Hey, but Chris, and, and going back to your uh, question, uh, as far as exotics and uh, the white-tailed deer, man, I you know, this place had some uh, red stag. It had some elk on it when I got it. had some axis deer. In retrospect, I would have liked to have kept a couple of those axis deer just for the heck of it because they're so pretty and they're very nice to, uh, to look at and they're good eating. But, uh, man, they'll kick a white-tailed deer's ass and they'll take over the feeders. So, that's why you know we took those guys out. As far as the guy bringing the feral hogs in, mm. you know, like you said, I agree with you. <laughs> we got enough hogs out here in South Texas. Me and Ted can vouch for that. Yeah. And uh, God dang, I saw one cross the road the other day. He didn't get a shot off on him, but uh, that rascal. I will be out there for him tonight. I'm not deer hunting anymore. But hey, man, you know, just use your common sense. You know. If you, if you can uh, go introduce yourself to your neighbor and get along and, you know, to kind of discuss things, a high fence doesn't need to spring up. Uh, I don't know how many acres you guys are on, but if your land has been in your family for over 130 years, man, it's a pretty good history. You ought to have some pretty good relationships built in, I would I would surmise. I agree. Uh, but, you don't, you know, if your neighbor, if he's bringing on exotics and he's bringing on feral hogs, is he running a commercial operation? You know, is he bringing people in to hunt? They want to hunt year round, like you can with exotics. Um, you know, he may not be super approachable. Maybe time to kick up some protein feeders. You know, and start slinging more corn than what you are. Make your low fence property a little more. Attractive. Maybe those animals will stick around, but but that's yeah. a good point. If someone's just going to bring in exotics, so people can come in there year round, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. And then you are able to hold a different Pandora's box of discussion. Right. I, you know, the exotics are what they are. I think it's more shooting than hunting. I'm not a fan. Now, speaking of the animals themselves, they're beautiful. I love to I love to look at them and I love to watch them. But as far as a hunting type scenario, eh, not so much. Let's move on. We talked enough about that stuff. All right, before we continue on, I need to take care of another great sponsor of this Steve Austin show, and he's not just a great sponsor. He also happens to be a close personal friend of mine, Diamond Dallas Page and his DDPY program. And Dallas knows y'all are making your New Year's resolutions, and a lot of them are about living a healthier life in 2017. That's why he's offering the biggest sale ever on DDP Yoga right now. He's giving y'all 25% off the DDP Yoga Now app, the DDPY DVDs, and all the DDPY swag. You can get 25% off T-shirts, mats, heart monitors, hats, and more. Just go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. And that's not all. If you buy the DDP Max Pack today, you'll get 50% off your second copy. So that's 50% off the 25% off you're already getting. That's a huge savings. And, of course, if you buy the DDPY DVDs for 25% off, you still get three months of the DDP Yoga Now app. Dallas's program has already helped thousands of people, including Mick Foley, who's dropped over 100 pounds doing DDPY. He looks great, and he says he's in the best shape of his life right now. So take control of your own health and fitness in the new year. Get on the DDPY program today and take advantage of this huge sale. 25% off all DDPY-related merch at ddpyoga.com slash Austin. That's ddpyoga.com slash Austin. If you're in the market for a car, then you need to check out TrueCar.com and the TrueCar app. TrueCar gives you the pricing information you need to feel confident about your purchase. When you register with TrueCar, you'll see what other people in your local market paid for the car you want. From there, you can connect with a local TrueCar certified dealer and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. TrueCar shows you real car pricing on actual inventory, so you see competitive pricing offered to you by TrueCar certified dealers for vehicles that are actually on their lots. 
True Car makes car buying easy, no matter if you're looking for a brand new or used vehicle. There are over 500,000 pre-owned vehicles available from True Car certified dealers nationwide, and there are over 13,000 True Car certified dealers, and over 2 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the True Car certified dealer network. True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit TrueCar.com or download the True Car app to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. Here's a question. Hey, Stephen Ted, I've been enjoying the podcast from the BSR. Always fun to hear the hunting stories and the headaches and hassles you guys have when maintaining the ranch. I'm just curious as to what brand of rifle you guys prefer to hunt with and what caliber works the best for your conditions at the ranch. I live in western Pennsylvania and prefer Remington Model 700 and a 30 odd 6 for just about anything I'm hunting for. Take care. Swig a beer. Eric from Somerset, Pennsylvania. Well, I tell you what, when it comes to the promotion of the latest, greatest cartridge for whitetail deer hunting or anything else, you know the advertising and all the push for the new caliber because you know back in the day you know, or still you know 270 and 30 odd six are probably the number one and two selling deer cartridges in the united states of america has been that way for a long time and those two cartridges are great and the 30 odd six you know they've kind of fallen off uh in the last shoot decade or so ever since seven mag came around right. a long time mm-hmm. ago when it was the hot thing and then you know, the, the ultra mags came around and those are the hot thing, but man, that 30 out six, you can use it for just about anything because there's so many loads for that gun. You can use that as a varmint gun up to a, a big North American game animal. So that, that's a great round. As far as, you know, me being out here at the broken school ranch, I'm a 308 guy and I've got a seven, I've got a seven mag. I got a 300 win mag. I got a 280. I got a 30 odd six. I got a bunch of stuff. I got a 270. But when I started shooting at 308, at the ranges that, that you know we're taking deer at, at about you know 100 to 175 yards, I just love that cartridge. Not a lot of recoil. Works good. The Hornady SST bullets just work like magic. That's just the gun that I prefer out here. Ted, uh, you originally started off with what out here? 243. 243 yeah. but then you upgraded to a heavier car- cartridge than that no i i was shooting that 243 and and i didn't have i had a 30 out six but it was uh, a hand me down from my grandfather you know it was more an heirloom than you know a, a precision rifle uh and you let me shoot you let me shoot your camo 308 and then your tango 308 and i you know i fell in love with that and then Talked me into uh, getting one from the the first one from Steyr. Yep. And then uh, shot that. And then after that, it was, you know, I'm all about 308s now. Now Man, I'll got, tell you what, like uh, Mitch came out here, he had a two, uh, he had a 270. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, 270 is an outstanding cartridge. If you're shooting in a little bit more wide open country than correct, we are, correct. I just think it's a bit much for the, the distances that we're shooting. I think the distances we're shooting, the 308. We have had you and I are the only guys that have come out the whole season that shoot 308s. Yeah, we have had the least amount of problems with the animals that have been shot. You know, with the 308 cartridge that that tells you two things: one, the 308's good cartridge; two, you and I can shoot and we practice at it. And the bullets are working. And the, yeah, yeah, okay, so three things. Yeah, um, you know, I'm. I'm I'll take my 300 Win Mag to Nevada with Mitch, yes. but but other than that, down here, you know, I'm I'm a 308 guy. Man, I got my 7 Mag, which was my gun down there in Georgia when I was hunting with Paul Orndorff and Ravish and Rick Rude on that swamp country. We had we uh, leased 2,000 acres, but you know that was back in the day. You know now doing what we're doing, man, that 308 is money. Uh, I'm talking about trying to get out to Nevada more and do some hunting. And I was asking Mitch, I said, hey, man, I said, you know, what do you think about that 30, 378 or that 338 Lapua, which is very popular out there? And he goes, Steve, it used to be just the 300 Win Mag, and that's what everybody had. And then all these exotic cartridges or these uh, offshoots or these hybrids or whatever you call them, these wild cats. Wildcat. The yeah. wildcats started coming along. 
but man, because I was looking, okay, if I'm going to start hunting the vat a little bit more than, you know, I have been in the past, which is not anything, do I need a different gun? I go, no, man, with my 300 wind mag, I'm mm-hmm. going to go out there and do whatever. Cause I, I'm, I'm not looking for an excuse to build another gun. I built that 300 wind mag, so I'd like to be able to use it, and it sounds like I'm going to be able to. You know, and it's not a knock on the people that shoot the the different calibers. You know what I mean? You've yeah. you've, you've got some real designer rounds being built these days that yes. people are, are you know doctoring with. And I'm cool, man. I'm all about shooting and do you know do whatever spins your cap. Um, but when we when we started blasting here, and I said, man, we may need more bullets. Dude, I went online, and what? Two days later. Another case around show up, and I mean it's it's just that easy. The three hundred eight is is easy to access, as opposed to some of these you know designer cartridges or you know like stuff 6. that 5, yeah right stuff yeah. you got to hand load. Yeah. It's like lordy, I don't I don't want to work that hard. But you know some it's like golf clubs. You know it's I don't think you hit the golf ball any better with you know a, a two thousand dollars set of clubs over a. Eight hundred dollars set of clubs. You either got the skills to do it, but if that's what you want to swing, let her rip. Yeah. Hey Steve, I don't recall ever hearing you and Teddy talk about bird hunting at the ranch. Any game birds out there like doves? I would be curious to know what type of birds you hunt and what type of shotgun you use for your bird hunting. Thanks, Craig from Duluth, Minnesota. Craig, we talk about birds all the time, man. Uh, right now, Teddy, dove season is back on, right? Correct. Correct. And so it's going to last for how long? Till the end of January. That's what I'm saying. We got bird hunters coming out here. Uh, Quail will last until I think the second week in February, so we're we're hot and heavy in it right now. Both of them. So here's the thing: we we're talking about trying to get our shotguns out. I ain't been able to because I got to jump on my tractor, and that was one of the big things that we were talking about last night when I closed out that last deer. Hey man, we'll get our shotguns out. Yeah, yeah. But man, it's hotter than hell, and I do want to see your uh, your dogs work, but do we got too much work to do? But we have a great quail population out here. We've got great doves out here, Craig. So uh, we'd like to, but my time is winding up. Ted will be out here for a while longer. The other hunters will be out here for a while longer. But i I gotta, I got to start wrapping things up. And as far as what I shoot, man, i got a Benelli. I can't tell you the model number because I don't know, but it's a semi-automatic. Ted, what's your go-to dove quail gun? Uh, quail, because I'm closer, I shoot a Stoger over and under 28 gauge, uh, and then for quail or for doves, I shoot a Stoger over and under 20 gauge. So what's the choke on those? Improved. Okay. Yep, top and bottom. Yeah, I, d- I dig yeah. on the improved yeah. cylinder. But uh, I mean, as far as the the bird hunt right now, yeah. I'm not I'm not putting my short hairs on the ground when it's 85 degrees. Rattlesnakes. You know, rattlesnakes. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now we get a couple of cold days in, and we'll go run them in the morning. Right, you know, when when a little bit of dew on the ground, so they can smell the smell the birds. Yeah, we'll do it for a little while. Well, we, we got a. I know we got a lot of work to do, but <laughs> <laughs> all work and no play. Yeah, yeah you ain't shitting. Uh, we got one cuss word in on this podcast. <laughs> a lot of people like pro wrestling listening to the show. Here's a wrestling question, Steve. I watch his video and can't help but think, why isn't the WWE using Arn Anderson on screen in some capacity? The guy has the respect of every wrestling fan worth a dime and kills it on the mic. He is the greatest tag team wrestler possibly ever, and he's tough enough to have earned the nickname The Enforcer. Wouldn't he be a perfect advocate slash manager for a tag team, especially a young team trying to learn the craft? The guy can still deliver a promo better than anyone except maybe Heyman. I would love your thoughts on this topic. Al, working man for the Pepsi Cola Company. Hey, man, you ain't got to sell me on Arn Anderson. The clip is actually uh, from YouTube. Let me pull it up right here. If you want to get on YouTube and just type in best promos, Arn Anderson, the enforcer, about two minutes and four seconds back here to my email. Uh, Arn Anderson is a good friend of mine. Arn Anderson is a, a, one of the best tag team wrestlers of all times in the Hall of Fame. I loved him and Ole. Loved him and Tully. I liked him and Ole a little bit better. But, I, man, you got to ask WWE that question. Uh, does that guy have knowledge for days to dispense uh, to the roster that's there? Absolutely. And that's why he works there right now as an agent. 
But, man, Arn Anderson is money on the mic. But, you know, in today's micromanaged system, you know, maybe not so fast, my friend. And I know they're looking to stay young or, or, or get younger on television with the product. So you're not seeing as many vets out there. But And that's not a knock against the system. But Arn Anderson, yeah, damn good promo, damn good worker, and bottom line. So I'm an Arn. Arn Anderson is one of my favorites of all time. I've been talking to him about trying to get on a podcast for a long time. We just can't make everything line up and make it happen. But, no, I, I agree with you. That guy is badass. Let's go on to another question. Here's a question from Nick in Jackson, Missouri. Hey, guys, how's the check liver light? Well, I'll answer that one for you right now. My check liver light went on about a month ago. I'm lucky I'm not in the hospital. Anyway, on with the question. Hope all is good as you're wrapping up another year end at the BSR. My question is for both of you. I have shot a fair number of deer in my life with rifles and bows, so I'm starting to use alternative weapons just to add a little excitement into the hunt, such as muzzle loaders, and I'm using a 44 Magnum revolver with open sights. Any interest in trying these? My second question is for Steve. With Royal Rumble coming up, can you share a good Royal Rumble story? How did Bret Hart feel about the finish in the 1997 Rumble? I believe coming into that, he was set to win to have a rematch with Sean at Mania. Hey, Nick, I don't remember about the Royal Rumble, uh, but let's talk about that 44 Mag. I bought a 44 Magnum revolver with open sights to try getting close and shooting a deer with a pistol. And I've been shooting bows for a long time, but I've never shot uh, a deer or any animal with a bow. I'm not into the whole muzzle muzzle loader. I'm not into the whole muzzle loader thing. Doesn't do anything for me. Uh, but I would like to get closer. I would like to use uh, my 44 Magnum revolver uh, that I just bought with open sights. Uh, and I don't know if I can pull back a bow with my shoulder being in the state that it's in. Teddy, what about you as far as trying to get into different weapons to take a deer? You know what? I got that uh, crossbow you gave me a couple of years ago, and I've been I've been shooting that, man. And you talked about fun. You know, it is, it's a little louder than a regular compound bow, um, but so fast. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't even see the flight of your arrow, like, you know, but today's bows are the same way. As far as muzzle loader goes, man, that seems like an awful lot of work, you know. Now, you got me that, that wheel gun, uh, that three fifty seven, yeah. and that's the first revolver I've had with anything other than, you know, a two-and-a-quarter-inch barrel because yeah. all that was personal carry. Now, I'm looking at that thing, and I'm digging, you know, maybe going after javelina or a hog or something. You know, once you, once you get proficient with yeah. it, with the open sights. But that, that part I like, you know, but it's one of those things where – I'd, I'd want to close out a couple of hogs first to javelinas, you know, to make sure that, that I could do it before I, you know, say, yeah, I can hit a target. Let's go deer hunting with it. But I think I think that would be a gas. I mean, the, using a three hundred eight is fun. I love to bow hunt. You know, I always have, always will. Um, but I like the crossbow, and now with this revolver, I'm, I'm real excited to start shooting that. Man, I got a chance to uh, go shooting with Lynn Thompson, and that's when he broke out all those wheel guns. And I've always been like, you know, a 9 millimeter, 45. Right, same you know, thing. automatic guy. And those, those are great guns, and they're fun to shoot. But then we start getting to the wheel guns, and you talk about really trying to take an animal with one. And you're talking about 6-inch or 8-inch barrel. You know, and, and I'm not talking about Lynn like Lynn's good with open sight, I think he's out past a hundred yards, he's, which is insane. Yeah. I mean, well, that's how much he practices. Yeah. But for me to be close, you know, with a revolver, man, I'm looking. I, I want to be forty, fifty yards. That that's what I'm looking at. Right. I, I want to be basically in in bow distance. Correct. Correct. But because I just want to make a clean kill and make sure I, I am proficient. But that's all the the distance I want because. I want the experience to be close. I don't want to take a gun with a shorter barrel and less accuracy at long distances to take a deer at a long distance. Not I want to use that gun to take the deer at a short distance because that's what the goal is, to get closer to the animal and make a clean kill. Correct. And, I mean, in this terrain, you know, tromping through all of this brush, for some, you know, animal that you didn't get a quality shot on, you're asking, you know, for nothing but trouble. But, uh no, I would like to get into shooting steel now with the with the revolvers and stuff. I mean, we got that one gong, and that's that's a lot of fun. But I think you know, in the, in the off season, I'd like to shoot the pistol more. 
All right, Ted, let's move on to another question. I All just right. made another round of Broken Skull Ranch margaritas. Here we go. This uh, question from Nicholas. Steve, love the show when you two are shooting a breeze. As someone who has never hunted and knows nothing about it but finds it interesting when you talk about it, what the hell is a deer stand? Nicholas. Go ahead, Teddy. What the, what's a deer stand? A deer stand is a little hidey hole that you build. <laughs> No, it's a it's a basically a form of concealment. It's a box, uh, metal, wood built out of you know a number of different things. Brush, you, branch, yeah, yeah, anything. Yeah. I mean, you could run T post and a wire and you know brush. Yeah, it's just a way of trying to conceal your outline and your movement from the animal's vision and keep you out of the elements when you know when it's raining or it's too cold or something. Gives you a, a good vantage point uh, for different travel corridors for, you know, for us, we're hunting over feeders, you know, so it kind of puts us in a catbird seat to, you know, look down over the, the feeding area and see what's going on. Man, a lot of times, you know, from what I've read, some of the people hunting in Calgary, Alberta, you know, Saskatchewan, I mean, their deer stand might be leaning up against a tree. Right, right. You know, and maybe right. they got a shooting stick or something, but your stand is what whatever it is. You know, ours are, a lot of ours out here are 4 by 6 aluminum boxes. We've got some insulation in them. We've got some pop-up blinds, which you can Google pop-up blind. Those things cost about, you know, 100 bucks, and you can take them down and set them up. We've got just a, a little plastic chair sitting inside of them. You know, back when I was hunting in Georgia with Paul Orndorff and Rick Rude, we would just build brush blinds and put a camp stool there and just have something for a rest. So the deer stands we have now, like Teddy said, you can get some, some concealment from the weather, a roof over your head. If the, if the wind's blowing like hell, you know, you don't you know, get pelted by the wind or the rain. It's been so hot, it's almost a curse. Right, right, right. Because you'd rather be in the open. Right. Uh, I, I actually prefer the pop-up blinds. It, we've, we've hunted out of the deer stands. We've hunted out of the pop-up blinds. I've been sitting in a lawn chair behind, you know, behind a tree. You know, and you were laying in the middle of the road, you know. Yeah. I was laying in the middle of the road using my binoculars as a rest. And, uh, you know, so it worked out okay. But to answer your question, man, a a deer stand is, you know, a place that you found where there's deer, there's a crossing there, or there's been, you know, tracks there, or as we're hunting over feeders, as Ted said earlier. But a deer stand is simply the place from which you're hunting. How technologically advanced it is is left to your imagination and your desire. And, you know, and we didn't even go over the fact of the climbing tree stands Correct. that a lot of people use. Ladder stands. And the piney and woods, and, East Texas, yeah. Georgia, Alabama, stuff like that. But a deer stand, you know, is just a place that you call your deer stand with, with where you hunt. Hey, man, back when I was hunting in Comstock, Texas, out there by Del Rio, I mean, dude, we were just hunting out of, uh, you know, two-by-fours and, and plywood, you know, that my dad would make and have a camp stool with little bitty windows to shoot out of mm-hmm. and just a place to sit. I've got the the very first uh tripod stand so to speak that i that i bought when i got here to texas is basically a six foot folding ladder made out of tubular steel with a plastic swivel chair like you'd find an old yeah. john boat you know and and you can fold that thing up sling it over a shoulder carry it you know to a travel corridor spread it out like a ladder climb up that thing you know you don't move too fast and does it have that little doesn't have nothing no you just sit up there like really? a like a bump yeah that's that was so the, what you shot because a lot of those or some of those ones like you speak of yeah they had that little ring around them so that would be your wrist and you what could you, you could cover rest? you up while i was bow hunting out of it okay. so i wasn't i wasn't yeah. you know rifle hunting but the little ring around it you could hang the burlap on it for more concealment yeah. no i was using this for bow hunting uh you know and you just sit there perfectly still you know and i mean imagine you're you're out in the cut on you know sitting on top of a six foot ladder in a plastic chair yeah so it you know it can be whatever whatever you need it to be <laughs> but it's interesting we have a, a little stand over here that we're hunting at and, and when you hunt it we didn't put a pop-up blind we'd put a deer stand there you just back in and your yeah. kind of was like a mule and you hunt out of it and then i was like i would drape a burlap camouflage thing on the front of it but what i was missing was the fact that on the back end I needed to drape something so that they couldn't skylight me. Right. If you have that backdrop behind you, then they can't see you in front of the brush behind you. 
So they're smart. The same thing with the deer stands that we got with those sliding horizontal windows. They'll look at that stand to see if they see a silhouette of a man that should not be there uh, in order to take somebody out. So the deer is smart. Oh, dude, you know what? And I had a perfect idea for what we were trying to do about, you know, running and gunning in the buggies. Yeah. They make um, the cargo netting. You know, like the military cargo netting that they would use to cover up tanks, you know, out yeah. there in the brush. Get some of that. You could you could drape it over the entire buggy, you know, and just be compl- look like a big brush pile out there. I mean, I think that would be perfect. It would. You know, it would gather every thorn and sticker, you know, <laughs> within 100, 100 yards. But, yeah, it would be perfect for what we're trying to do. Here's a question as we wrap up this illustrious podcast. And this is heartfelt information coming from someone in Indiana that I will give it to. Hey, my son got drunk on New Year's night and had a hangover the next day. Any suggestions on drinking and any Austin or Ted remedies for a hangover? Thanks, Chuck from Bluffton, Indiana. (laughs) Okay. Best way to avoid a hangover. First of all, if you want me to give you a responsible answer, don't drink too much. Drink some water in between your drinks or drink a lot of water after you got done drinking. But most people ain't going to do that. So best way to avoid a hangover is just to stay drunk. (laughs) (laughs) That's a pearl of wisdom right there. (laughs) I'm 52 years old, Ted. I've done it all. I tell you what, if you got a hangover... You know, like people always say, a hair of the dog. I agree with that. If you wake up and you got a hangover, man, in the morning, a Bloody Mary, double dose of vodka, you'll feel real better, lickety split. (laughs) And, and, you know, that's just, you know, me doing what I've done. Uh, But here's the thing. I would never recommend that you just go haywire and just drink an ass load of beer. In moderation, just get you a good buzz, and then sip in a water, a 12-ounce bottle of water in between your drinks. Just maintain that buzz. But, dude, I've been around the horn, and back when I was, you know, running hog wild crazy, I was drinking everything in sight. Hey, you're going to pay the price if you drink too much. Correct. And as soon as you learn to deal with that, and it's like that old song goes, uh, the hangovers hurt more than they used to the older you get. Correct. That's Correct. true. Correct. So, Teddy, uh, your advice as far as how to avoid a hangover or to treat a hangover. No, I'm with you with the avoidance of a hangover. Uh, Drink water while you're drinking your hooch. Yeah. Before you go to bed, you know, I'll slug down a bunch of water. Uh, Take four or five aspirin before I go to bed. Come on. I swear to God, man. You know what what you're going to hurt in the morning. Four or five aspirin before you go to bed? Yeah. Are you stark raving crazy? No, you got all that water to dissolve and go straight to your head. Clear out the cobwebs. No, you still feel bad in the morning, but that's like... I do agree with the water consumption because a lot of hangover is dehydration. Dude, here's, here you go. You take those aspirin, it thins out your blood, it runs through your liver quicker, it, oh, it filters Jesus it. Christ. There you go. See, I've been watching a lot of TV. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a disclaimer on this. <laughs> that didn't come from me. That came from Ted. One time I was going to wrestle Dustin Rose, who was in a pay-per-view. So a lot of the guys back in the day would take a couple of aspirin before they got color. Because it thinned out your blood, you're going to bleed easier. So anyway, I go out there with Dustin, and it was actually the match that we had in 91 from Tennessee, whatever that match was. And people, it was a two out of three falls match. And so I got a blade made. It's on my wrist. Time to get color. I pull it. Well, I made my blade too long and, and cut it too thin. And so I was trying to dig with it, but I couldn't. It was, it was like uh, by the time the night was over and I woke up the next morning, it was like a, a chicken did a burnout on my forehead. <laughs> Because I couldn't get deep enough to really get in there and, and, and do some, you know, the, right. the right amount of damage to bring blood. And I took an, I'd taken four aspirin right before the match, and those aspirin went on an empty belly, went right to work mm-hmm. on my drum. And I was like, oh, my God, my stomach hurts like a mug. Now i got to go out there and wrestle. One of my favorite guys to wrestle with, Dustin Rhodes, have a bust-ass match, come down to get color. He says, I'm going to scratch on my forehead with this bogus blade, and I'm pushing and pushing, trying to get that blood to flow. 
nothing. So I felt like an idiot, didn't perform, and then I had a gut ache on top of it because I took four aspirin. So I got to shoot holes and you take a bunch of aspirin theory. Dude, you, you can't take aspirin on an empty stomach. Now, if you're, yeah, if you're already drinking, if you're drinking, you've got, I'm under the assumption, you ate first. You know, so there, there's something on your stomach that'll buffer that aspirin. Uh, as far as a hangover remedy, find yourself Waffle House, scrambled eggs, greasy hash browns, a greasy bacon. <laughs> Get you the old scoop of grits and a big slab of butter on there. You know, the butter melts and it's got, you know, so much oil and grease off to the side. Looks like a, a you know, a tanker wrecked. Yeah, you got to you got to bombard your system with some good old grease and fat. The words the word Ted speaks are as true now as they were 500 years ago. <laughs> Dude, I tell you what, you 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 bust out into a waffle house oh, that Lord. will surely curtail a hangover. Ooh. But again, you know, sometimes out here every now and then, you know, I don't sleep very well to begin with. And like I knew I wasn't going to sleep well this morning, this would be the first morning that I hadn't hunted in a long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, I woke up last night at 3 a.m. At 4 a.m., I'm looking at the clock at 5 a.m., 5.20. That's when my alarm clock usually goes off. It's 6. Okay. You know, I'm thinking about, okay, just get up and make yourself a Bloody Mary. I ain't got no hangover. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to, you know, we're talking alcohol and stories while we're here at hunting right. camp for all intrinsic purposes. But I said, no, nah, man, because, you know, Shannon's coming down. You know, I want to be a professional. Right. I want to make sure I'm in shape. Uh, and I'm, all, I'm always in shape anyway, to speak of from a professional standpoint. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is my personal vacation. <laughs> Train wreck. <laughs> so anyway, I bypassed all those uh, decisions and right. just, just laid in bed and kind of did my thumbs and saw your text when it came in. You didn't go out. Right, right. But, yeah, I mean, man, if you want to uh, deal with a hangover uh, – what do you call it? Hair of the dog? Hair. Uh, see, I'm, I, I can't do that, man. I mean, if I feel poorly, yeah. you know, I mean, the first thing I do when I get up is swear I'm not going to drink anymore. And then I try to. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't kidding. I'm never ain't doing, doing that. I'm you. never doing yeah, that again. Doing yeah, that again. Yeah. If there's ever been a time to dry out, we just jumped into it with both feet. Uh, you know, no, but get you some grease in your belly, some food in there. And by maybe. Three o'clock, then you're ready for a beer. But you just got to buck up, and and, I, and I'll hit up a little caffeine in there. Cause you just got to get you got to get going. Yeah, don't feel sorry for yourself uh, because <laughs> you did it to yourself. So you got to go. Here's one thing I always appreciated about Barry Wyndham, and Barry Wyndham could go. I mean, like in the ring, and you know, out out on the town, you know, just having a couple of drinks, you know, and he and, and Barry could drink, but he never sold it the next day. And I was like, God dang. That guy's badass. Yeah. So if you're gonna if you if you're gonna shoot, what's the deal? You're gonna dance with the devil. You're now you gotta price. pay the pay the band. Yeah, pay the band. Whatever yeah. whatever the deal is. Mm-hmm. Hey man, you just uh, go do it. But but if, but if you do feel the effects, hydrate. Yeah, I dig some caffeine. I dig a lot. Like I said, a lot of greasy food. Right. Get you in, get in the shower. Oh no. yeah, yeah. A shower you can take. <laughs> You can't lay there in bed because that just that just perpetuates a problem. Yeah. Dude, what's the most hungover you've been though? Oh, probably that time out here on the deck when we burned up all the propane because yeah. we left the barbecue open. Yeah, because I got up the next day and uh, man, I I I wasn't sick, but I knew I couldn't function. I couldn't work. I couldn't get out in the heat and work. I knew that would kill me. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't even be able to, you know, dig my own grave before I, I closed out. But that that's probably the, the most hungover I've been. Yeah, I had a couple of bad hangovers with you when we were putting down our whiskey back in the day. But probably one of the worst hangovers I've ever had was my first night when I took Kristen to the Los Lonely Boys concert mm. in Los Angeles, California. Well, actually, I didn't take her there. I met her there, but it was the first date that I asked her on. And, dude, you old romantic, you. I was, I was flying, and I was flying. <laughs> I'm going to say that. I'm not going to incriminate myself any further. My wife didn't know everything that was going on. Well, well, she wasn't my wife then. Right, right. She didn't know everything that was going on at the time. And that was the night where I tried to go back home. I was living on Diamond Dallas Page. I left my keys in my manager's truck. Couldn't get in. I spent the night with Kristen. That wasn't a great scenario to begin with, 
Dude, I was so hungover by the time she dropped me off at DDP's the next day. And I crawled in the bed you know, after drinking a couple of beers. The next day I called her on the phone. I had a case of beer. A case of beer. I sat there in bed, talking to her that night. <laughs> and the next day I went over and watched Sunday, Sunday football. But God dang, I, watching the Los Lonely Boys and Reese Winans was playing with them. Reese Winans, the old keyboard mm-hmm. player from Steve Ray Vaughn. And we went into his trailer and I talked to him for about two hours, but I was so hammered. It was a great conversation. I wish I could remember what exactly we talked about, but that was one of the worst hangers <laughs> I ever remember. Snuck in a fifth of vodka, drank damn near all of it, along with them, some other stuff. And dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to steal your 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 uh, deal there. You know, honey, I left my keys in my manager's vehicle. I'm gonna have to stay with you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Works every time. <laughs> we just celebrated seven years of marriage and twelve years together. Teddy, a uh, couple of weeks, you can head back to Rockport. Yes, what sir. you got lined up? Some remodels, some work. How does 2017 look for the business side? 2017 is going to be real good. Uh, I'm going to start by finishing the remodel that I got halfway through before deer season started. You know, and the customer knew, you know, that they, they had two options. They could either, you know, get half of me before deer season or they could wait. And after deer season, I would do the whole thing start to finish. Um, no, I'm a, a lot of people know when I'm coming back into town, so the phone will start ringing and it's and it's good. It's, it'll be a real good year, real good year. Hey man, you got a website? You ever thought about starting a Facebook page? I'm not for dating and trim. Do you, you, you ever do that for business? Ah, uh, no, no. I mean, I've had a couple of offers on Twitter. You know, people wanting to build yeah. me a website and. You know, I well, always your word of mouth is probably so strong you don't need it. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, I think with what I want to do down the road, you know, cause I don't want to be, you know, doing all of this stuff by myself all the time. Yeah. You know, I'd like to take a little more of a supervisory role and, you know, get, get more employees and diversify a little bit. I think that I need to step up to the plate and do something, you know, start showcasing some of the work that I do, you know, so more people see it because word of mouth, that's the only way I advertise now with my business is through yeah. word of mouth, you know, and I'm, I'm as busy I'm as busy as I want to be, you know, and I turn down stuff that that. That being said, you yeah. work your ass off. So yeah. when you say you're as busy as you want to be, yeah, but, but I want you to sound like a slacker. Or like, no, oh, no, I'm I'm rolling over in money. You work your ass off. But, no, I I say I'm as busy as I want to be yeah. because I know I I'm committed to working here at the ranch and taking care of the deer and everything during the off season. So. I need to bookmark time to come out here and and do that, and I schedule myself accordingly. Plus, you know, I want to fish. I want to golf. I want to, you know, I I want to go to Nevada. You know, I'd like to take another road trip out there to L.A., you know, and see you guys, see, you know, see the remodel when it's all said and done. Um, you know, but no. I want you to come out and look at the quality of work. Cause, man, this time <laughs> when I got the th- those three sliding doors from China, I'm in mean, there all cattywampus is on that rail, and I got these adjusters because it wasn't square. Right. And in the demo process, the guy found a lot of defects with the house. It's been an ongoing cluster muck. Right. And now it's being done right by a good dude. So when you come down, you say, yeah, you did my house ain't fancy. But just a remodel, it's not going to mm. be any fancier. It's just going to be done different. So check out the work once it's done and give me your 411 on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, it is a it's it is a nice house. You know, it's a nice neighborhood. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see it, you know. I think that's cool, the way you guys explained it with that trifold door, you know, that, that to open up. You know, to get more air in, because I'm all about having windows open and, you know, right. stuff like that. But where I live down here, one, we can't do it because windstorm requirements because of the hurricane. They won't allow that much, you know, glazing, that much glass area. Uh, plus, dude, you can't have, you know, your doors and windows open. Stuff comes walking in. You know? Stop being critters. <laughs> that and, you know, the, the, the SoCal weather, especially at Miranda Del Rey, yeah. being a mile from the beach. I mean, man, it's just like... And my wife's like, she's one of those natural temperature people. Right. I'm an air-conditioned freak. But, you know, it, if the weather's good, mm-hmm. yeah, if we can open both the front and the back and let that breeze come through there, yeah. Yeah. I'm all for it. See, I do that at my house to blow the dog hair out. 
you know, <laughs> between bouts of my cleaning lady coming, you know, yeah, if I got a good, good southeast wind, I'll open the north back to, you know, the front of the back door and let the dog hair blow out. Teddy, we're going to stop his podcast now on Twitter and on Instagram. He's Ted Fallon 361 on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Steve Austin, BSR. I just started a Twitter account for my new I just started a Twitter account for Buck the Mule. My Twitter account for Buck the Mule is at my mule buck. If you want to follow along, it's my way to uh, represent uh, the great company of Kawasaki USA and what I do in that vehicle so I don't cloud by the timeline. But if you want to follow our adventures, you can follow me at my mule buck on Twitter. Teddy. Good talking to you. I'll talk to you again tomorrow when we go over New Year's resolutions. Yeah, and then we won't see each other for a while. No, man, i got to go back to L.A. and get busy. Uh, it's been great. And the thing about it is when I come down here, I've been doing it for nine years, but everybody I know knows this is what I do. Yeah. I know it's what I love to do. Yeah. But, God, I go on least here. God dang it, we work hard out here. We do. We do. It's I mean, fun. It's fun. And our passion is hunting. But, I mean, the work is real. Did we got these grandiose ideas of, you know, we're going to come out here and do this, and we're going to go do that, and we're going to, you know, set up the gong and go long-range shooting, and we're going to, you know, yeah, all we do is work, 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 you know. But, I mean, it's it's cool, and the place looks phenomenal, and the deer herd is top-notch, but it's it's every bit of a working vacation, heavy on the work. <laughs> Well, like I said in a podcast a week or two ago, when I look at you, I see a reflection of me. Bags on your Ooh. eyes. I think his, his eyes were glazed <laughs> over. What's he up to? I got You're that. not different than what I've been up to. <laughs> got that hairdo like when you're in The Stranger. <laughs> yeah, I think I was going to post a picture of that picture of me and The Stranger. My wife says, because I was going to do it for Happy New Year's. Right. She says, well, you can post the picture but don't do it for Happy New Year because <laughs> there's no correlation. <laughs> that was a bad time in your life. That was a $20 million movie that y'all did for 800 Gs. <laughs> don't post it for this. You put that one in your pocket till I don't know, Halloween or something. <laughs> God, man. Hey, here, here's the thing for you. I didn't give you guys a video of the week on the clothes. But, man, we were sitting around last night with my brother-in-law, Mitch, and Ted was over here. We had enchilada casserole and tenderloin uh, deer meat that I fried up in the skillet. And we was watching Smoke in a Bandit. God dang, the, the Jackie Gleason in that movie. I already told people to watch it already before. Yeah. If you ain't never seen, to all you young millennials out there, I say that with all due respect. If you ain't never seen Smoke in a Bandit and you want to see a damn good movie, and Jackie Gleason. And of course, Burt Reynolds was a heartthrob back in the day. Sally Field, spectacular. Uh, and there's some great cameo uh, appearances in there. But Jackie Gleason steals that show. Absolutely, absolutely. I I liked the uh, the YouTube deal of uh, Jackie Gleason's. You know the best best yeah. you know clips out of that. You know is his one liners. Oh, dude, it's phenomenal. I mean, no matter what age you are, you got to sit down and watch that entire show. It's it is a classic. I want to eat a Diablo sandwich, <laughs> drink another broken skull ranch margarita, get on my tractor, and cut until sundown. This is Steve Austin signing off with Ted Fowler. We go. Everybody's got a to-do list. Drop off the dry cleaning, pick up some milk. Here's an idea. Let's add save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. And the good thing is you don't have to drop off or pick up anything. All you have to do is go to GuyCode.com, and in 15 minutes you could be saving 15% or more on car insurance. Extra money in your pocket? It just may be the most rewarding to-do you do today. All right, everybody, give me the go home. Q is time to wrap up his podcast and ride off into the sunset. The wind is howling outside. Pretty good gust of wind going on out there. Probably blowing in the cold front right when we're packing up, getting ready to get back to Los Angeles, California. Video of the day, don't have one for you today. I've been too busy entertaining guests, doing work, and hunting deer. But that all stops because we've met our required numbers. Season is over. Bird season takes over. Hey, the new season of Broken Skull Challenge is wrapping up. Sunday nights at CMT on 10, 9 Central. 
all the shirts that are worn in the latest season of Broken Skull Challenge are at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Austin. Hey, I also got a damn good IPA if you're in IPA beers. You get the Broken Skull IPA from El Segundo Brewing Company. Stop into the brewery at 140 Main Street in El Segundo, California, or pick it up at Whole Foods and Total Wines if you live in Cali. If you want to order it from InsideTheCellar.com, check and see if they deliver a state that you live in that they can ship to. And you can find everything that I have for sale at BrokenSkullRanch.com, including the Broken Skull Cold Steel Knife. If you want the best price on the baddest knife on the planet, go to Amazon. It's 75 bucks on Amazon and use my links when you go. All of my Amazon links are at PodcastOne.com. Click on the Killer Deals button in the top right corner of the page and then hit the Steve Austin Show button. I got Amazon links for Amazon USA, Amazon UK, and Amazon Canada. Just use my Amazon links whenever you're doing any online shopping and Amazon will kick back a few bucks to the podcast and it does not cost you anything extra. There's not any hidden fees or charges. Buy whatever you plan on buying and help out the podcast in the process. Bookmark it so you can find it easier. And you'll also find the links to the great sponsors of this podcast. I appreciate y'all supporting the sponsors because they are the ones who let me do this for you free twice a week. So big thanks to DDP Yoga. Go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin and get 25% off all DDPY DVDs and related merch. To Loot Crate. Order your WWE Slam Crate at LootCrate.com slash Austin and use the promo code Austin to save three bucks. And to Helix, go to HelixSleep.com slash podcast to get 50 bucks off your first purchase. Hey, the 60-second AP News headlines are coming up next. Until then, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. I want to say thank you to Drop Stop, one of the great sponsors of this show. Drop Stop is the original patented seat gap filler as seen on TV Shark Tank. Get the original Drop Stop at buydropstop.com and use code STEVE for two free gifts and free shipping. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. The Angry President. I'm Rita Foley with an AP News Minute. We've learned that President Trump was seething when he fired FBI Director James Comey. He felt Comey let the FBI's Russia investigation play out in the press, we're told. Former Trump campaign advisor Roger Stone tells the Today Show this morning the Trump presidential campaign did not collude with Moscow. The idea of Russian collusion is a canard. It's a falsehood. Earlier on the Today Show, White House Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders was asked about a line in the president's termination letter to Comey that read, I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation. Some have called that statement into question. Sanders was asked about it. Uh, look, I, I'm not sure on the, the reasoning behind that exact part being in there, but I do know uh, I spoke to the president directly, and he said that those uh, moments and conversations did take place. I'm Rita Foley.